I don't know why, but I'm one of those people who gets introspective around New Year's. Around the end of December, I always get to thinking about who I am, what I believe in, what kind of person I'm becoming, and if it's possible, I think I'm both entirely different from who I was a few years ago, and fundamentally the same person as I was when I was two years old. When I was two and started talking, I quoted from the books my parents read to me. My parents' favorite story was the time I told a guest at a fancy party, I'm going to be the first of my species to fly, which comes from a book about two hippos named George and Martha. To be honest, if a literal baby came up to me at a dinner party and told me that, I'd be pretty interested. I was the kind of kid who thought up grandiose solutions to pretty elementary school problems. I created my own imaginary country and assigned one of my friends to be the president. When things got too violent at recess, I drafted a peace treaty. I'm sure a lot of this was inspired by Roald Dahl and Lemony Snicket and playing way too much Civilization and Age of Empires too. By the time I got to high school, I knew that I lived in my own head and in books and strategy games, and I knew that that put me on the periphery of the social order. Luckily, I had a great core group of friends, but outside of school and theater, we pretty much kept to ourselves. I had a lot of homework and not much time to think about my feelings. I was pretty lonely. That's where I was in 2011, in the middle of 10th grade. I was 16 a rule follower, a snarky poetry writer, an atheist who thought people were only religious because they were afraid of going to hell. I was sweet and smart, but I didn't really know much outside of my own little bubble. And then I discovered some interesting things on YouTube. Today, everyone is on YouTube, and it sounds kind of silly to talk about discovering it. YouTube is just the place you go to search for your Minecraft videos, or your pasta aglio e olio tutorials, or whatever else you like. But back then, YouTube wasn't a place lots of people spent time on. It was where you'd go to find a viral cat video your friends sent you, and then move on. I'd experienced that part of YouTube a bit when I became a fan of Autotune the News, and I'd log on every once in a while to search for new episodes. But something interesting happened to me in like January or February of 2011. I'd gotten on YouTube, clicked on some related videos, links as you do, and eventually arrived at this video called Fun Science by this kid Charlie is so cool like. People don't know enough about the moon these days. I don't know how much you know about the moon, and I honestly don't know how important it's going to be to your life if you don't know anything about the moon at all. But for a while now, I've wanted to do a mini-series on YouTube in which I talk about science-y stuff that interests me, and I thought, you know what, if I'm ever going to start doing that, then the moon is probably a good place to begin. It was the first time I'd ever seen a vlog. Maybe. I'm not sure now, but it's certainly the first time I saw a video of somebody being a nerd outside of school just because he liked it and people were watching. I started watching all of Charlie's videos. I parasocialed hard for him. I wanted to be his friend, I wanted to go visit him at his apartment in London, and he was the first one to explain to me that there was a YouTube community. It sounds ridiculous now, just one YouTube community, but back then the number of people uploading regularly to YouTube was small enough that a lot of people made videos responding to one another, and some of them were acquaintances or even real-life friends. And the YouTube community back then was pretty nerdy. Charlie recommended Wheezy Waiter and Elmify, who basically built these imaginary worlds in their apartments where they built stories around their clones or alter egos of themselves. Around that time, I also learned about Vi Hart, who made these videos that showed me how math was delightful and beautiful, that there were more reasons to think about math than teachers' promises that one day it would be useful. The YouTubers I discovered around that period kept mentioning these guys named John and Hank Green, and I kept seeing their channel, the Vlog Brothers, recommended to me on other people's channel pages. So finally, I looked them up. By then it was June of 2011, and John Green had just made a video called On Religion, which started like this. Good morning, Hank. It's Monday. Nerdfighters often ask us if we're religious, a topic we've been reluctant to discuss over the years, mostly because the quality of discourse about religion on the internet is 
atrocious. That said, many nerdfighters know that a decade ago I worked as a chaplain at a children's hospital, and I was also briefly enrolled in, although I never actually attended, the University of Chicago's Divinity School. As I said before, I was a pretty staunch atheist at the time, but here was this smart, thoughtful person who almost became a minister, which is like the most religious job you can have. The video didn't make a case for religion. Instead, it gave everyone permission to see ourselves in people different from us. Christians, Muslims, atheists, whatever, all of us share this worldview. Almost none of us would abandon our comforts to help others. Almost all of us would acknowledge that much of our time each day is wasted. In short, Hank, if we just judge humans by their actions, we look like a bunch of nihilists. But we aren't nihilists because we all feel called to make the world better, to understand and observe the universe, to make art, to bring beautiful things into life, to contribute in some way to the human experiment. Everybody wants their lives to matter, to have meant something. That call to meaning is the foundation of religious worldviews, but it's also the foundation of successful secular worldviews, which is why I don't really care to debate the existence of God with people. We're all living our lives and trying to make meaning from what we observe. Whatever conclusions we draw, that's something that unites us. This video blew my mind a little bit. And then Hank Green, who is the other brother of the Vlogbrothers, had just made a video about why he loved simulation games from the 90s and 2000s. This was the first time I'd seen someone do a close reading of a game I liked, or really anything fun that wasn't assigned reading. The poet Billy Collins, who I love and who inspired me to start writing poems as a kid, once wrote, The trouble with poetry is that it encourages the writing of more poetry, which is exactly what happened when I saw these videos. I wanted to make stuff like that which is why I started making YouTube videos. First sketches, then vlogs and songs. I learned from YouTube that it was easy to pick up the ukulele, then video essays like the one you're watching now. I also, of course, became a nerd fighter, which is the fan community that surrounds the Vlogbrothers. I went to a school that required an entrance exam. I auditioned for school shows. I wasn't used to a community that you could be a part of just by saying you were. If you want to be a nerd fighter, you are a nerd fighter. And being a part of a community like Nerd Fighteria helped me feel like I was a part of something in a way I think lonely atheist nerd kids like me might have missed out on otherwise. I wasn't religious and I'm still not, but I've always been ritualistic. My family and I have certain foods we eat on certain days. My mom made granola bars before all my final exams. I had a special incantation I said before all my high school theater performances. It was nice to have these videos to tune into a couple times a week and to be able to write DFTBA in the yearbooks of my friends who I knew were in on the secret. It's been just over 10 years since I became a nerd fighter and a person on the internet more generally. So much has changed, and so much has stayed the same. Charlie is so cool-like, and Elmify have given up YouTube to focus on writing, and Wheezy Waiter has totally reinvented his style. I was 16 then, and now I'm 27, older than Hank Green was when he started uploading videos. John and Hank both have kids now, and they work together to professionalize their educational content into Crass Course and SciShow. I became an adult, and my life coincidentally started to resemble John Green's life in some weird ways. He went to Kenyon College. I did the Kenyon Young Writers Workshop when I was a teenager. He lived in Chicago for six years, and I went to the University of Chicago. He got his start in writing by freelancing for the public radio station WBEZ, and I interned there early in my career. Which reminds me, as a kid, I wanted to be a teacher. And now I have this job that I didn't even know existed and which YouTube gave me the idea for. An educational content creator, professionally a podcast producer, and a YouTube video essayist as a side hustle. It's a good blend of things I love. Writing and teaching and being a theater kid. But after all these years, watching the Vlogbrothers on Tuesdays and Fridays has stayed the same. And what I'm trying to figure out is, how has having this constant of nerdfighteria in my life shaped who I am? I think that as I became an adult, the Vlogbrothers served me well in a few ways. 
I'm going to focus here on what John Green has taught me because honestly, I'm still kind of parsing through all the insights Hank has made over the years about business and internet culture and all the other things he's thought so hard about. For a while, I called Hank my favorite vlog brother, partly because John got really famous around 2012 to 2014 when the Fault in Our Stars book took off and became a movie, and I didn't want Hank to feel left out but also because saying Hank is my favorite was my way of saying John is the one who reminds me more of myself. So, things that being a nerdfighter has given me. First of all, being a nerdfighter means being unashamed to be genuinely interested in stuff. I went to the University of Chicago for college, which on its surface sounds like a great fit for me. A school full of smart, nerdy kids who all want to discuss important books. But a lot of the kids I ran into there seemed kind of ashamed of being nerds. I don't know whether it was a defense mechanism from being on the periphery of the social order growing up, but a lot of people wanted to show a kind of cool detachment, like they would say some theorist wasn't really that great or that they could get away with BSing a paper, or that their nerdiness generally was this kind of costume they could take off when class was over. I think the Vlogbrothers helped remind me that there was another option out there, that I could be accepted as someone who truly cared a lot about school stuff. There's this John Green quote. Because nerds like us are allowed to be unironically enthusiastic about stuff. We don't have to be like, oh yeah, that purse is okay. Or like, yeah, I like that band's early stuff. Nerds are allowed to love stuff. Like, jump up and down in the chair, can't control yourself, love it. Hank, when people call people nerds, mostly what they're saying is, you like stuff. Which is just not a good insult at all. Like, you are too enthusiastic about the miracle of human consciousness. I bought that quote as a poster for my dorm room, and when one of my housemates who desperately wanted to be cool saw it, he told me I should burn it. So I stuck it to the outside of my door. I should also say that now I'm part of the video essay community, which is a mostly left-wing bunch of people who do sincerely believe in what they're doing, but who sometimes react to how terrible the world is by adopting this sort of ironically detached attitude, like sighing, rolling their eyes, drinking a lot. I think it's funny, but I also like remembering that I have the option to do these videos as my own unaffected self. When something makes me angry or scared or excited, I can come right out and tell you that. Second thing I got from Nerdfighteria, I did end up making internet friends, just not the ones I thought of originally. The Vlogbrothers led me to their online game show, Truth or Fail, which led me to one of the Truth or Fail guest hosts, Fizzy Lyman, who hosted the Fizzy Olympics video contest, where I met my friend Teo, who did a bunch of audience participation and introduced me to some of his subscribers, Mark, Katrina, and Rose. I've actually met some of these people in real life, and we talk on the phone and send each other Christmas cards and stuff. I never ended up crashing at Charlie is so cool like's apartment or subbing in for the vlog brothers on one of their paternity leaves, but from orbiting in their solar system, I found some of my favorite asteroids. And third thing I got from Nerdfighteria, a lot of John Green's writing reached me at the exact right times in my life. I read Looking for Alaska when I was just starting to think about college, and the story about moving to a boarding school, away from your parents, to seek a great perhaps, as Rabelais said, made the prospect of moving away from home and making a brand new group of friends seem exciting, not just scary. For a sheltered kid like me, that was what I needed to hear. I read Turtles All the Way Down just after college, when I was finally accepting myself as a person with a mental illness. The main character of that book has OCD, just like John Green, and the song she and her mother sing to ground themselves, We're here because we're here because we're here because we're here, is something I sang to myself a lot that year when I needed to calm down. 
Side note, if they ever make Turtles All the Way Down into a movie, the final scene needs to have we're here because we're here played on a solo harmonica. It would be so austere and beautiful and it would just leave the audience humming quietly to themselves as they left the theater. Movie producers, can we make this happen? I also appreciate how John grew more comfortable over the years telling his own story. Watching his videos, you can tell a lot of his fiction is inspired by his own life. But in The Fault in Our Stars, a book that came out right after I joined Nerfiteria and which I loved, one of the characters is this rude, cantankerous author who insults the hero and heroine. To me, it felt a bit defensive. like. Don't think too much about the authors of the books you love, they'll only disappoint you. In The Anthropocene Reviewed, a podcast from the last couple years which just became a book, John Green proves his earlier self wrong. The podcast claims to be a history of objects like scratch and sniff stickers and the song You'll Never Walk Alone, but what John really does is talk about his personal connections to these things. He's writing his memoir and it's a really thoughtful and useful memoir. In his essay about the movie Harvey, he talks about having a mental health crisis and having to move in with his parents in his mid-twenties. I'm in my mid-twenties, and I moved in with my parents last year, and I had a mental health crisis. And John's work is one of the things that gives me permission and language to talk about it. So thanks, John. I think there are a lot of critics of John Green who find his books kind of preachy, like the meaning of his stories is kind of tied up in a little bow at the end, and why does he quote so much? I mean, who starts his book by having a teenager tell his parents that he goes to seek a great perhaps because Rabelais has told him to? But if you think about it, John quotes from books because he never really abandoned his goal of becoming a minister. Because what do ministers do? They quote from what they're reading, they interpret the quotes, they connect them to their own life experiences and others' lives, and they report on what they learned. John's wife, Sarah, helped inspire him to write the Anthropocene Reviewed by telling him that review writing is basically memoir. A memoir, a sermon, a novel, I think they're doing a lot of the same kind of work. They're collecting treasures from books, from research, from memories, and weaving them together into a little patchwork, and leaving that patchwork on the table for people to steal from as they please. Which is what I'm trying to do in my work. When I was 20, I wrote a collection of poems and sewed it into a chapbook. I titled it, Quotes from Other Books. The Vlogbrothers and my Nerdfighter friends have given me permission to love the things I love, and to quote from books, and to weave together meaning in my life. And for that, I have to give Nerdfighteria five stars.